My name is Deborah Wilson. On Friday, November 4th, 2011, I returned to work still not feeling well. I had taken the previous two days off due to what I thought was tremendous stomach bloat. I had eaten way too much of my granddaughter's birthday cake during the week and thought that must be the cause of the distress. About 3 p.m., a couple of office workers told me I didn't look well and perhaps I should go home. As I was driving the six miles to my home, my lower back was becoming increasingly painful. I prayed to get me home safely, just so I could lay down. When I arrived home, I was surprised to see my daughter Amy was there, which was unusual. Then I dropped to my knees. The paramedics took me from my bedroom into the ambulance as I was later told. I came to in the ambulance and was screaming for pain medication. They said they couldn't give me anything until I was diagnosed. The pain was so horrific by then, about 3.45. I couldn't endure it. I was going in and out of consciousness. I heard them talking about my blood pressure dropping quickly, and my pulse was very low. I managed to tell them to just keep doing their thing, and to drive faster because I was going away for a while. They agreed they better do what I said. Next thing I remember is being in the emergency triage in my own room with glass doors. I was all hooked up but struggled to get off the bed because I had to use the bathroom. Still, the pain was incredible. Right across from my room there was an elderly lady in a johnny sitting on a cement bench, like you would see in a cemetery or in a park. She was just staring at me. Her mouth was closed, but I'll never forget her eyes. I was yelling at her to help me. She didn't move, just continued to stare at me with those eyes. I continued to scream at her to get a doctor, and she never moved. Then slowly she got up and walked away. After what felt like hours, the pain stopped, and again I was in an ambulance. When I woke, a doctor was yelling in my face. He said I was going into a different hospital because they didn't have the team I needed. I told him he didn't have to yell. I wasn't deaf. He explained I had ruptured an abdominal aortic aneurysm, AAA. I asked him to write it down because I would never remember that. Then I noticed he was on my cell phone. He was talking to my son, Adam. I told him not to scare my kids, to say that I was just going away for a while and to please return my cell phone to my pocketbook. Then the ambulance was filled with operating room nurses and doctors prepping me for what was to come. Months later, my daughter told me that when the technician in the first hospital did an ultrasound and detected the aneurysm, they gave me morphine for the pain. I asked her how she knew that and she said, Grace, my granddaughter, and I were with you the whole time. I had no idea they had followed the ambulance. I said okay, and then you must have seen the elderly lady in the johnny sitting on the cement bench. She laughed and asked what I was talking about. There were only nurses running about frantically. They don't even have cement benches in the emergency room. At that moment, I realized she was an angel, sent to get me through the pain. I can still see her close-mouthed face, her eyes boring into me without a word. I have no recollection of arriving at the hospital, meeting any doctors, or being wheeled into the operating room. All I know is that I was floating, upward for a while, then just forward, and there was so much to look at. I was very warm and comfortable and felt pure love and joy at being there. The path I floated down had magnificent columns of undulating soft pastel colors, columns from far below to higher than I could see. There was an underlying music all around me, the music of the vibration of color. I felt as though I was heading for the sun, but there was no glare and the temperature was perfect. I realized I was in heaven. Thirty years prior to this near-death experience, I had an experience after giving birth to my daughter. I floated upward in a white tunnel. At the top, my great-grandmother greeted me. She was dressed in her house dress with her usual apron. She hugged and kissed me and told me I had to go back. It wasn't my time. I told her it was okay and let her know I wanted to stay. I even asked her for one good reason why I had to leave. She reminded me of the new baby girl I just had, and told me all will be fine, and that she would see me soon enough. She was the catalyst of my desire to become a medium, and still is. Getting back. After traveling through the columns, I came to an enormous opening. The feeling of comfort, warmth, and love I was experiencing was more than I had ever imagined, and I knew then that I did not want or need to return. At the opening, I was gently veered off to the left towards the entrance of the most magnificent cathedral-type structure. I floated in high above where the floor might be. Again, I floated inside the huge cathedral-like structure for a while. 
I briefly wondered where all my deceased loved ones were. Surely someone would come greet me. At that point, I came to an archway intricately patterned in the most beautiful colors. I could actually see the archway breathing. As I floated into the tremendous hall, I saw my mother below me to the left, sitting on the edge of a settee, dressed in an off-white gauze flowing skirt and billowing blouse. So unlike her, I was so happy to see her. I floated close to her and asked what she was staring at. She slowly averted her head in the direction of yet another huge hall, which was a soft glowing white. I could deeply feel her sadness and remorse. I slowly floated toward the next hall and instantly knew why she was so sad. I was stopped from going further, but could clearly see myself lying on a table surrounded by seven doctors. I was being operated on. The only part of me that could be seen was my closed eyes, some bangs, and my heart feverishly being repaired. I told my mother to stop them because it was okay with me if I stayed with her right where I was. She said without moving her lips that it was not our decision. With reverence, my mom made me look again closer. It was then I saw four highly ascended healers working very closely with the doctors. At the head of the operating table was my head surgeon. On each side of the table were the remaining six doctors. Two healers were positioned behind the three doctors on the left side, and two healers were standing behind the doctors on the right side of the table. The healers were from long-ago eras. The undulating colors of their gowns were deep purples and greens. Their headdresses were like the Pope's tall, roundish, triangle-shaped mitre, Matra. The mitres were very deep red and gold. They were from different parts of the ancient world. I tried to enter the hall and tell them to stop, but I was forced to stop by a very powerful, loving energy. I floated back to be closer to my mother. I told her I understood her sadness. I understood she couldn't keep me there, and she made me understand I would be okay. So we sat together for a very long time. I became overwhelmed by sorrow and regret knowing I had to return yet I knew these spirit forces were not to be argued with. As the operation progressed, I could feel the doctors begin to relax. They chatted among themselves and patted each other on the back. My mother had gone. I felt very tired and alone as I entered my earthly consciousness. When I woke about twelve hours later, my nurse welcomed me back. She briefly explained my condition. I asked how much time had I missed, and she told me to forget about it because I would never be able to put the pieces back together again. She didn't know me very well. My physical recovery was long and arduous and not without residual symptoms. I learned I had only one working kidney. I could only see deep purple out of my right eye. My digestive system had to be retrained to eat only certain foods. I couldn't stay awake for more than four hours at a time. Emotionally, I was a mess. I was angry that I returned. My surgeon told me he hears that often when people undergo difficult surgeries. I told my family about my trip to heaven. They listened intently but I felt like I wasn't being heard. So as time passed I became depressed. I wasn't me anymore. The things I loved to do before I couldn't do anymore. Because my boss decided to let me go after my detour, my finances were a disaster, which added to the chaos I was feeling emotionally. Then I made a deal. Angrily I told God that if he wants me to be here on earth, then it's up to him to show me the way to endure. He's the one who gave all of us free will yet he took away my free will when I was in heaven. I was spiritually confused. Every day when I woke, I reminded him that he had to help me. I promised I would be patient and do what I had to do on my part. After a few months, my affairs fell into place in the most unusual ways, from the least likely sources I could ever imagine. Yet I still felt unconnected. Over a year later, a friend had suggested I look into the Greater Boston International Association of Near-Death Studies Group. At the first meeting I attended, a man sat across from me who had a glow surrounding him, which was undeniable. I just had to speak with him. After the meeting I approached him and told him he was singing my song. He clearly knew what I meant and validated all my mixed-up feelings. He had his near-death experiences about fifteen years prior and told me I had a ways to go before I felt normal again. He simply said, Choose life. You already know where you're going to end up. I told him I felt like I had a leg down here and a leg up there. He suggested on tough days to reach up and grab a piece of what I know to be reality and bring it down here. I will forever be indebted to him and his ever so helpful words of wisdom. Since then, I have been free to appreciate my life and all of the circumstances. I feel now that I can sit back and simply watch it unfold. I know there is nothing more important in this world than love, 
and that love never dies. I learned there is absolutely nothing to worry about. I now truly believe everything happens for a reason, which, if we are patient, will unfold right before our eyes. I have truly come to understand the true meaning of faith. Unlike hope, which is always there, faith is based on knowing. As a medium, communicating with spirit for many years, I felt my life wouldn't be changed too much. Yet looking back, I see there are so many changes, changes that have embedded themselves into my soul. My life is calmer and quieter than before my detour. I crave a lot of alone time. I pray more and with focus. There is no control. It truly is an illusion. Now two years later I am living a totally different life spiritually. Hope is always there. It is based on desire. But faith is based on knowing. I choose faith. Watch this near-death experience next about a guy who met Christ and had amazing experience with him. You simply can't afford to miss it. That does it for today's video. Let me know what you thought about it in the comment below.